Thank you. So does this mean that you and Ralph Nader are going to combine and run for the presidency in 2012? Um, I, will, I cannot comment on that. So. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm actually uh, independently affiliated. Okay. I, I just want to, yeah, one of the things that, that Alan talked about is he yeah. said he'd heard that politicians don't believe it. And, and, and I, it sounded as if you sort of discount the fact that, you know, if you raise gasoline taxes, people will revolt. I don't discount the fact. I think it's an educational issue. I think the fact of the matter, and the other issue is what people mistrust about taxes is it's followed by spend. And, and if we're going to do a gas tax that works, it has to be followed by, by being revenue neutral. Every dollar that the government connects here has to go back into people's wallets. It just has to disincentivize them from, from basically doing things like we have tax on cigarettes that are bad for society and incent things that are good. So put it, give it to back to the payroll tax. Give it back to the income tax. Reward people for work. Let's just not, let's get people not incentivized to consume too much of a resource where a billion dollars a day are flowing out of this country. Okay, that's a, that's a view. Uh, what role do you think entrepreneurs will play in the, the green mobility movement? And will small businesses lead the way for larger companies to change? I, I don't think it's a leadership issue. I think, the, as I said in the last slide, the future is a partnering issue. I think small companies are going to work with big companies to work together and leverage each unique advantages. What Bright offers is some unique IP, a wonderful culture for innovation, and a lot of good focused know-how on niche markets. And big OEMs have manufacturing, they have great purchasing, they've got distribution, they've got great sales and great branding. So I think it's actually not a threat. I look at it as a collaboration opportunity. As an automaker, have you announced yet when job one will be? Yeah, we announced job one when it was 2000, I have to talk to John, it was 2008. It was originally gonna be end of 2011. Is that right? Um, again, right now, until the capital markets unfreeze, and we're seeing them do that a little bit, our timeline is directly dependent on when the Department of Energy gives us our conditional loan. And that's why, because they haven't given us a timeline, we're looking increasingly, unfortunately, abroad. So like some of the most enthusiastic investment we've seen is from China. So all goes well. If we can get full, this program back on track and funded, we are aiming now for 2013. Uh, has the Obama administration done all that it can do? Have you been disappointed in what the administration has done? I, I personally like President Obama, um, but I would say I can't comment on details, but I, yes, I am disappointed in our experience with the ATV and IP program. Do you have plans already for an assembly plant? Will it be in yes. Indiana? Will it be elsewhere? We're exploring several states. We do have uh, pretty detailed plans of our assembly plant. Uh, the, we just did a formal calculation for the DOE on jobs. 6,000 jobs that are ready to go. Right. Shovel, re, shovel, we're, we're shovel ready. We've got the technology. We've got the vehicle. We've got the people to execute. We've got the supply partners. We've got the markets. We've got customers. We had nine customers representing tens of thousands of vehicles a year. Fortune, Fortune 50 companies write personal letters to Secretary Chu saying that they want this vehicle and, and perceived barriers like it's a, it's a hybrid is not going to slow their adoption rate. It's going to increase their adoption rate. I mean, fleets are, are, are again, I mean, pun intended, the thirstiest for efficiency. I mean, they, they're, because they, for them, it's really the bottom line. Okay. I, um, the, you, you, you talked about a, a emissions of the vehicles, and it was great moving from, from horse manure to the, you know, the typical emissions from an internal combustion engine. Right. But there are emissions also from, from electric vehicles, right. and a lot of that has to do with the recyclability of, of some of the batteries. Right. I, I, does, does there need to be a, a leap in technology on that front as well, not just developing new batteries to, to make this thing a viable project? It's a, it's a great question. Um, the bottom line in terms of if you cared about life cycle energy, is 85% of the energy of a vehicle is in its operation. So the paramount thing you can do if you care about life cycle energy is save it during use. And the reality is batteries, I mean, this is the great thing about markets. Lithium and the, and the materials in the anodes and cathodes are expensive. It's going to create markets for recycling. And there's a lot of actual promising technology and companies today that are recycling batteries. So again, I don't want to, don't, don't take my, my enthusiasm for dismissing the challenges. Take my enthusiasm that the challenges come with rewards. And if we, if we can get these challenges and tackle them, there's going to be payoffs for society and for us as businesses. So that's why, so th these are not to be dismissed, but I think they're solvable. Who, whose responsibility is it to develop the, 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 the forgive me for saying it, the, the end solution for the, for the battery? Whose responsibility in terms of the, like in terms yes. of the cost or the safety? 
cost, safety, the technology, and all that? Well, I mean, we're all, I mean, the industry, and again, I think uh, we're, we're responsible for different things. I think the battery companies themselves are responsible for improving the chemistries. Uh, and auto companies, including Bright Automotive, are responsible, and this is, again, where we're adding tremendous value, like why GM decided to insource its battery pack. And our, our CEO, John Waters, who is the EV1 battery pack inventor, to put those, it's challenging, but to thermally control those batteries, make it safe in a collision, and make it so we can volume manufacture these at low cost. So in the end, it is a partnership, and we're responsible, I think, for the, probably the hard part of that. Okay. Uh, Alan Mulally said that EVs might be 2% more of the U.S. market in, in 10 years, and you obviously have, a, have a, a more bullish attitude toward that. What do you see as a, as a reasonable growth rate? Yeah, I, again, that's pure, he's probably talking about pure battery electric EVs, like saying chihuahuas are 2% of the breed of dog. That's, that, that, pe that pet owners adopt. I think electrification, which includes the Volt and our vehicle and the Fisker, uh, the market forecast, for example, BCG, which I think is a little pessimistic, was 20, 25%. IBM's report actually said there's potential for 100% of electrification touching vehicles. So obviously, uh, I think the market is considerably bigger than 2%. And I think if Alan included plug-in hybrids there, he would too as well. Okay, how do you think the uh, Chevy Volt's gonna do it, 40 grand? Well, I think that's, and I, we talk about this a lot. Um, you can't just reinvent the technology. You, you've got to reinvent the business model. If you just take a $4,000 powertrain, right, and put in a $20,000 powertrain to replace it and not change anything else, it's a challenging sell. And so that's why we're working with fleets, because fleets buy on spreadsheets, 60% of them lease. So as you notice, we focus on total cost of ownership. So the key for the Chevy Volt before it hits the early adopters like me, and I'm a big customer, I'm, I'm probably a customer of the Volt, I think it's an awesome car, uh, is providing solutions to the customer that lets them buy that vehicle and enjoy the savings of electricity. And a good example of what Nissan's thinking about doing, I think they might be, which is leasing the battery. So you can go out and buy a Leaf, and I think it's going to be the low 20,000s, and then you pay a lease payment every month to Nissan, and your electricity bill plus your battery leasing bill is going to be less than your gas bill. And those business models start to work. Okay. I, I, you, you spoke about individuals recharging their, their, uh, their vehicles overnight at home with a plug-in. Yeah. But obviously there will need to be some kind of quick charge stations. Um, is this a new infrastructure? Uh, does it have to be at gas stations? Why can't it be at dealerships? For yeah, all, all of the above. Uh, I think, again, pure battery electric vehicle, ba big battery pack vehicles like the Tesla Roadster, which has a 54 kilowatt hour battery, has to have fast charge. Uh, a battery like the Bright Idea, again, it depends on your, your design strategy. Our usable energy is about 10 kilowatt hours. You can plug it into an outlet. Remember, these are parked at fleet depots or sometimes drivers' homes. It can be charged in about eight hours to get the electrification. Well, most people's cars are parked at night for more than eight hours, so the, the, literally the Bright infrastructure modification, an extension cord. And there are solutions like that out there, but ultimately we, we do need to move to a level two and above infrastructure. But again, I see that as a, a market driven approach, and, and again, if you look at what the Leaf's doing on their infrastructure approach, partnering with their environment to provide a one-stop solution for the customers that they buy a Leaf, they get a, a rapid charge station at home, and their environment's working with the local contractors and permitting to make it a painless experience that I really don't, I think the infrastructure issue is an overblown problem, a per overblown perceived problem.